So to, to give you all a um, kind of sense of who I am, I'm a professor out at Johns Hopkins University, and I was just finishing my postdoctoral studies and transitioning into uh, becoming a faculty member when the accident that Willie talked about happened. So this was very early on in my academic career, but kind of crucially, I'm a, I'm a researcher by training and disposition. And so I went through this um, pretty awful experience after a motorcycle accident, and then in the immediate aftermath, um, kind of when I got some distance from the trauma of it, I, I got overwhelmed with the curiosity about whether I was unique, whether the system is really as broken and just absolutely a mess as it certainly appeared to be uh, from the inside. And it turns out the answer is yes. Um, the system, the healthcare system, uh, hospitals, physician training is all just a mess when it comes to pain, pain medicine, addiction, addiction medicine. And so I figured out some things. Uh, I eventually decided to write them down and that turned out to be the book in pain. So I'm gonna give you a kind of quick overview of uh, some of what I did in the book. It'll include reading a few sections, very short. And um, Willie said that uh, very often we'd wanna do some kind of discussion in this sort of session. It's gonna be a, a very small, intimate uh, discussion. I hope you have questions. Um, but uh, yeah, I will do the kind of formal presentation first and we can chat for as long as you want. So, um, all right, May 23rd, 2015, that's the setup. So it's Memorial Day weekend, gosh, uh, over five years ago now, which seems kind of crazy. I've been telling the story for long enough. It's like yesterday, but also not. Uh, so Memorial Day weekend, I have been riding motorcycles for a decade or so, huge part of my life. I also have a one and a half year old baby girl. Her name is CNM at the time, one and a half. She's enormous now, but um, one and a half year old baby girl. And I know I should stop riding. That was, that's like what a responsible parent would do. Um, but it's just a huge part of my identity and I, I'm too slow to give it up. And so on Memorial Day weekend, it's gonna be this gorgeous day. My, my riding buddy and I decide we're gonna go out to Shenandoah Mountains, do some twisties, get all geared up leather, armor, all that sort of thing, make it like uh, three blocks from my house, still in the neighborhood. And uh, a kid driving a big old white van blows a stop sign. I have a split second to respond, kind of veer out of the way and he smashes into me right on the left side. My left foot is shattered, is crushed right between the van and the motorcycle. So I get hit, I get struck, I get tossed from the bike, but the real damage was done because the left leg was pinned between the two vehicles. And so luckily I was in all of the leather and the body armor. So my head, my back, my spine, all of that was okay. But I landed on the ground, pulled my armored boot off and my foot's just been blown apart. Um, so I know people who come to these things have more and less like uh, tolerance for, for grotesqueness. So um, here's the relevant bit your bones, if they shatter, kind of turn into like shrapnel. And that's what happened. So the bones on the inside of my foot, it's called the first metatarsal and the great toe, they shatter and blow a hole out through the inside of the foot. And that sort of wound is limb threatening. So I would find out a couple of days later um, that I'm in what's called a limb salvage situation, immediate threat, so they're gonna amputate the limb. And so they're gonna try, uh, the goal is to try to save it. That's the setup, because when you have a limb threatening injury, Either they amputate it, and it's very often actually a quick recovery. As long as the amputation is successful, they don't have to go back in. But if they reconstruct it, if they're successful in avoiding amputation, which sounds like it should be success, it's a long road. So that's what happened to me. Luckily, on one sense of luckily, I still have my foot. So if we were in person getting to do this, I kind of strut around the stage. I'm like, ah, spoiler alert, this is all me. Like, I have a bio foot. Um, but that means that I had this long road of many surgeries and lots and lots of pain, lots and lots of pain medication. So what happens is I get going down this series of surgeries and surgery number five is the big one. And what they have to do, the physicians have to basically carve out a piece of my thigh and use it to plug the hole in my foot. So it's an enormous surgery that's called a free flap because uh, they're taking part of one part of your body and using it to, to um, stitch up another part. 
So I have this very big surgery. Pain goes through the roof. It's like a nine hour surgery. It takes me all day, all night to come out of anesthesia. But the next day I am in kind of unreal level of pain. And so that's what I'm gonna focus on for the first little bit here is June 16th is a few weeks after the initial incident. And it's the day after this surgery number five. And the reason June 16th turns out to be really important is because two things happen on the same day. First, I'm actually treated really badly by the attending uh, physician in the ICU where I'm staying because I'm in so much pain. I'm asking pretty aggressively for pain medication because no one's listening to me. And when the ICU attending comes through, she's really dismissive. And she's, you know, I'm like, ah, oh, thank God you're here. I need more medication. The nurses, the atten the nurses, the in intern, the residents, they're not going to give me any more, more me medication. And the attending is like, looks up from her clipboard and says, yes, Mr. Reader, your repeated requests for more pain medication have been noted. I'll discuss its appropriateness with my team. And they like swoop out. So that's my first encounter with the healthcare system on June 16th after surgery number five. And I'm furious and I'm ashamed because I don't know what happened, but I know enough to like be humiliated because I was scolded. <laughs> I know enough to know when I'm scolded, right? Um, but I still have this big problem that I'm in pain and it's spiraling out of control. I've been in the hospital for weeks at this point. I'm very used to morphine and fentanyl and hydromorphone and oxycodone and all of it. I know what I need. And so I kind of pull my privilege together. Think about the guy who's going to help me out is this young doc who always spends a little extra time with me. He's the guy who calls me Dr. Reader instead of Mr. Reader because he's like asked about my research and stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's the guy I want, right? So I, I have a nurse call him. He comes to me. I tell him what happens. He's like horrified on my behalf. He calls his attending physician, who's the plastic surgeon at the ICU doc. And she's like, I will fix you up. I, uh, I'm going to call a pain management consult. So this specialty team whose job it is to get your pain under control, they're going to come through. She kept her word. Pain team came through. And they gave me all the drugs, like all of them. It was glorious at the time. Increased levels of fentanyl and oxycodone. They had gabapentin, just floated off into fairly comfortable oblivion. So when I tell the story that way, in this like really compressed form, it sounds like what happened on June 16th is that I was treated badly and then I was treated well. But I was treated with suspicion and I was stigmatized. You know, doctors use this word term of like drug seeker. It was treated like a drug seeker. I wasn't believed. And then I was listened to and given the medication that I thought I needed. The problem is that specialty pain team never intended to see me again, right? They were, th their job was to get me on a bunch of medication and get my pain under control. They did it. And then I never got any follow-up. There was no plan. There was no management. And so it wasn't until two months after my accident, when I'd been home from like, for like a month from my final surgery for the time, it wasn't until then that my orthopedic trauma surgeon, who I hadn't seen in two months, uh, I see him at a follow-up to get x-rays. He sees the dose that I'm on at the time. And he's like, oh my gosh, you're on way too many pills. It's way too far out from the accident. You've got to get off the meds now. But he didn't have any advice for how. It's kind of not his job. So he sent me to the plastic surgeon managing the meds. And the plastic surgeon, totally unconcerned, he's like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, uh, cut your dose into four and drop a quarter of your dose each week and you'll be done in a month. And it was terrible advice in case a couple of you here like decide to take off. Here's the punchline. That's terrible advice. There's not a way to taper opioids. And that's largely what, what sparked everything that happened to me. So the reason it's such bad advice is because cutting your dose of opioids by 25% once you're physically dependent, which happens to anybody, anyone who's on opioids long enough around the clock at high enough doses become dependent. It's not addiction, it's the physical response of your central nervous system to the presence of these drugs. And so if you take them away too acutely, you go into withdrawal. And 25% dose reduction is way more than enough to send you into withdrawal. It's small enough that you have to do it four times and it's gonna take a month. And so that's what happened to me. Uh, I followed my doctor's orders. I was never able to get any help throughout the following weeks. And so for 29 days, I was in opioid withdrawal. And every minute of every day was the worst day of my life. Um, if you think like withdrawals, what you see in the movies and TV, and somebody's coming off of heroin and for like a day they're shaky and sweaty and nauseated and vomit, like, and then they're done, thank God. 
it's just not anything like what withdrawal's like. It's the worst flu you can imagine times a thousand and then add hyperalgesia, so increased sensitivity to pain, add hyperactivity, the jitters, the shakes, your arms and legs kick, it keeps you awake, so you're insomniac, you're hyperactive in this like weird dysfunctional way, your internal thermostat's going crazy, um, and then you're also dysphoric because you're coming down from a euphoric drug, and so you're depressed and you're anxious. And so for me, like the, the real battle here was depression. So what I'm going to read for you is just a short excerpt. Um, it's a passage from the book that, that um, folks who read the book and, and liked it have really pointed to this as saying, like, this is where I started to understand what you're going through. So I thought I'd share it with you. It's just a, a couple minutes long. I've never read from my book on Zoom before. This is going to be interesting. Uh, so again, I have a, a one and a half year old daughter. Her name's Sinem. My partner, who's a hero, who, who carried me through this whole thing, uh, her name is Sadia. So those are characters that you hear uh, in this little section. And it's a lot about me crying as I'm in withdrawal. So there you go. My beautiful, wonderful baby daughter gets left out of a lot of this story. And that's really part of the pain. I, I simply wasn't present. So I barely remember her being there at all. I know that Sadia was somehow managing to handle childcare while also caring for me and running the house. And I vaguely, vaguely remember seeing him occasionally crawling on me on the couch while Sadia sat apprehensively on the ottoman, just inches away, watching so that she could jump up and grab her if she got too close to my foot or the surgical side on my thigh. But most of what I remember is solitude and pain. I do, however, remember one particular day as it changed my view of what my one and a half year old daughter was capable of. I had made it the whole day through late afternoon without crying, without the depression crashing in. I dared to hope that this might mean I was turning a corner and maybe I was gonna get some of my life back. And then around four or five o'clock, I felt the telltale welling in my chest and darkness circling. The feeling immediately caused panic and then despair. Sadia picked up on the first ring and I blurted out through the sobs. I almost made it today. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I had to call you. I started to think I could survive this, but I can't. This will never get better. I'm so broken, baby. I'm just so broken. How can a body possibly recover from this? She was already driving home. You will survive this, she said. Your hormones in your brain, they're betraying you, but it will get better. And just hold on, I'm about to pick up baby girl and then we'll be home to take care of you. I said, okay, and hung up. When the car pulled up outside the front window, right behind my spot on the couch, I tried to stop crying as I always did my best not to let CNM see me like that, but it was no use. The harder I tried, the more explosive the sobs became and I eventually just gave up. CNM tends to enter the house like a freight train and this day was no exception. When the door opened, she burst into the living room, singing at the top of her lungs, until she saw me. She stopped babbling mid-sound and mid-step, and her face turned serious. As she slowly walked over to where I was lying on the couch, I just cried to her. So sorry, baby girl. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I hope, I hope you won't remember this. She didn't seem upset though. She seemed in control. I was lying on my side on the couch, and so I was about eye level with her. She walked until her face was inches from mine, examining me intently with the deep, dark brown eyes she got from her mom. And she asked, Baba crying? Yes, Baba crying, I told her. Baba hurts, but it will be okay. I didn't believe it, but I was trying my best to be strong for my daughter. And then she did something that I didn't understand will never forget. She put her tiny little hands on my cheeks. She held my face firmly while she looked directly at me. And then she kissed my eyes one at a time. I had never seen her do anything like that before and I could hardly believe it. Maybe she had learned that at daycare. Maybe Miss Mary or one of her helpers had kissed her eyes after she fell down one time. Or maybe it was just an incredible empathetic intuition by my little girl. Whatever the explanation, I grabbed her and hugged her as tightly as I ever have. And I told her that she had just helped daddy get through one more night. The reason 
I like that story so much other than the fact that my daughter saved my life and that seems like pretty awesome. Um, it's, it highlights the fact that what happens with the rest of the story, namely the fact that I got better, the fact that I'm, I, I went down a path that led me here, having written a book, talking about it rather than you know whatever lies down the path of continued drug use um, until it becomes more and more disruptive is because I had something to, to reach for all the time because my daughter was crawling all over me and I had this incredibly supportive partner who was dragging me across the finish line. And so um, people will sometimes, I, you know, I did a TED talk some years ago and um, I get emails from people who watch it and say, oh gosh, you're so strong. And I'm like, oh, you missed the point. <laughs> I am not strong, I am pathetic. Um, I was an absolute mess. And the fact is I had all of the right resources. Uh, I was very, very lucky. And I had, um, I had something to, to fight for and people to hold me up when I needed it. And so at the end of that week, uh, which was an absolute nightmare, um, I went three days without any sleep at all, which is enough to make you go steadily uh, insane. I got to a point where I actually had started thinking about killing myself. And it sounds crazy and dramatic saying it now, but in the moment, if you think you're just broken beyond repair, that's, that's what seems reasonable. And so um, I eventually get scared enough that I think I'll go back on the, the medication, but then get lucky and just don't have to. I, I get another bottle of oxycodone, I put it on my nightstand, I'm ready to take it. And then I just fell asleep that night. And I hadn't slept in days, hadn't gotten real sleep in a month. And so like getting through that night convinced me I could, I could get away from these medications and I did. So I got lucky, that was the end of that story. And I made it out of this withdrawal and I eventually stopped being so sick and I gained some distance from it. And now I wanna go back to that June 16th date that I pointed out, like why was that so important? It was so important because it shows how incredibly bad we are at dealing with opioids in this country. Because in the same hospital on the same day, first I was under medicated. I had these pills withheld from me when I was in desperate, desperate pain. And then I had pills thrown at me by people who were never gonna follow up. And it led to this path, the path where I spent 29 days in absolutely hellish withdrawal, where I, a Johns Hopkins professor, a white man with finances and a supportive partner and everything to fight for, was on the nice edge of never coming off of these medications. And so what haunted me afterwards was how in the world are we supposed to think that everyone with less resources than me is supposed to do better in this just absolutely desperately bad system. So I started researching after I recovered mentally and emotionally for several, several months. I got curious and I kind of put my scholarship brain on. And about the same time that I was learning about pain medicine in this country, my mom actually had to have bilateral knee replacement. So this was, you know, some year and a half, maybe two years after the accident. And um, I was terrified for her because you don't go through knee replacement, let alone both of them, uh, without a decent amount of pain medication. And at this point, I'm just, I'm convinced it's like evil, dark magic, right? And so um, I, at this point, I've like fully exploited my connections at Johns Hopkins, which I hadn't, you know, early in this story. So now I'm friends with orthopedic surgeons and pain docs, and I, I exploit all my connections. I'm like, here's what my mom's gonna do, give me a plan. And so we did that and uh, I gave a plan to my mom and I was kind of a, a drill sergeant with her, like here's how we're gonna do it. But they, the doctor who did the surgery gave her 120 Norco tablets. So these are hydrocodone tablets. Each pill is worth about five milligrams of morphine. And I told her as soon as she got it, it's like, you are not gonna need 120. And if you do, you're gonna be in trouble. So, the next little section that I'll read is she goes through two weeks of just really, really awful pain because she's got a healthy respect for these pills. She doesn't want to overuse them. So she uses them when she absolutely has to. And by two weeks, she's done. Side coda, we can talk about if, if we do any discussion. Um, she actually had a little bit of withdrawal coming off of two weeks of five milligram Norco. And even having watched what I went through, didn't appropriately identify it. Like, had a hard time understanding what was happening. But that's essentially not what I'm gonna to read to you about. So here's, 
here's the information I was finding out about pain medicine right about the same time I watched her do this. So she's, she's recovered. Um, she stopped using the Norco. And I think about it several days later and I text her. I say, hey, mom, will you count the number of pills you have left? I want to know how many you actually needed out of that 120. So this is where it picks up. So she, she texts a little while later and says, hey, have 73 of 120 remaining. So she had used well under half of what she had been prescribed. Now I should have been surprised, but by this point, I'd begun to see the data on overprescribing for surgery. Practitioners in all different fields are starting to examine their prescribing practices, and they publish what the average prescription is for a given procedure, and then attempt to find out how many pills patients actually end up taking. Results like my mom's are not uncommon. A particularly striking result was published in 2017 by a group of researchers at the University of Michigan. Their study looked at a particular procedure, gallbladder removal, and found that the average post-operative prescription for this surgery was about 250 milligrams, measured in morphine equivalents for standardization, so 250. When the researchers interviewed patients, though, they discovered that the average amount of medication taken was only 30 milligrams. As a result, the group decided to uh, produce a prescribing guideline that included an educational component. It informed patients that they likely would need only a few pills for a handful of days and that they shouldn't take the pills unless they really needed them. In the months following the implementation of this guideline, the average amount of opioids prescribed dropped from 250 to 75 milligrams with no increase in refill requests. Just because opioids are seen as necessary in cases of surgery or severe injury then, doesn't mean that we can't make very real progress. Being exposed to opioids at all puts one at risk, and the evidence suggests that the length of exposure increases risk to a remarkable degree. As a result, we simply cannot justify sending more opioids out into the world than are needed. We can't allow doctors to routinely write prescriptions for 120 pills when 60 will do or for 30 pills when three to five will do. So that was my first little investigation of kind of understanding just how bad we are. And the basic thing was we didn't know. For 20 years, we prescribed opioids without any real evidence base. And doctors just, well, they were told to treat pain aggressively. So they just wrote for pills, hand over fist. We got a lot of work to do. And in the years since the book came out, since, since I've been working on this, I've been working with hospitals and working with clinicians on how they can do this. And like, there's little bits of progress, but it's tiny. The accident was in 2015. I've been working on this since 2017. Very, very little has changed in the meantime. We are still exceptionally bad. Um, but the last thing I wanna point out, and then we can talk about anything that you all wanna talk about is, I've been talking about pain and pain medicine so far, but here's this really important thing. So uh, pain medicine is hard and opioids are suspicious because opioids can be addictive. So people develop an addiction to opioids, sometimes have problematic drug use, and then they can lead to overdose. And so they've contributed in this country recently to the opioid epidemic, which is now more properly called a drug overdose epidemic because it's polypharmacy, it's, it's fentanyl laced in with all of the cocaine and benzodiazepines too. So it's, it's a lot going on, but 70,000 people a year plus are dying from drug overdose, which is just absolutely catastrophic. So we're scared of opioids because we use them in medicine, but they're the same drug, fentanyl, is used in hospitals and fentanyl in the street is killing thousands of people a year. And so doctors are freaked out and politicians and the media are freaking doctors out about them killing their patients, right? That's the kind of language that's used. But here's the thing, here's the secret. If we fixed prescribing tomorrow and everything was perfect, it wouldn't solve the opioid epidemic. It'd barely make a dent. And the reason is um, prescription opioids are a pretty small part of what's going in in the broader national context of addiction and overdose. So it's true that addiction, uh, that the current addiction crisis was sparked by really, really terrible overprescribing pill mills, irresponsible medicine, bad players in pharma, et cetera. But now the cat's out of the bag, right? There's a huge amount of um, 
just drug in the street. Some of it prescription, some of it illicit. Fentanyl comes through the postal service. Largely, it's just this is a synthetic drug you can make in labs. It's coming from labs in China. It's very, very hard to track. Uh, huge amounts of heroin on the street. So cutting off prescriptions doesn't do anything. So here's the last thing that I'll say. If we want to actually address the broader addiction and overdose epidemic, we have to do a lot more than focus on this one piece of supply, which is what we've been doing. So if you talk about prescription opioids, you're basically saying if we keep doctors from over prescribing, well, that will solve the problem, right? But if that's actually just one piece of the supply. And then supply is only one part of the problem, right? So if you use that language of like supply, well, that makes you think the economics, supply and demand, well, there's the demand side of the equation too. So here's another thing we could do. We could ask, why do Americans take so many drugs? Why are Americans in so much pain? Because opioids are analgesics, they're pain relievers, and we take drugs for reasons. So a really good reason to take opioids, whether it's Percocet, oxycodone, hydrocodone, whether it's any of those or whether it's heroin, they do the same thing. They, do, they numb pain, physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain, traumatic pain, right? So we could address demand. We could just try to help people who are in pain, get good mental health services going, build up infrastructure in that part of our healthcare system, address poverty, address joblessness and hopelessness. Like that would do a, go a long way towards uh, addressing the addiction and drug overdose crisis. We also, that's supply demand, that's not gonna fix everything because we have two point some million people with opioid use disorder already out there. So even if you don't funnel any more people into the crisis, the crisis is going, right? So we have to get the people who already have a use disorder help. And here's the thing, only 10% of those with a use disorder actually get specialty healthcare treatment. And that sort of, that sort of gap in service wouldn't be acceptable for anything that we actually cared about. What it reveals this stigma, it reveals the fact that we as a society don't actually care about getting people help when what they're suffering from is addiction. In the 10% of people who actually get specialty treatment, a bunch of them don't have access to the gold standard treatment, which is uh, what's called opioid agonist therapies or methadone or buprenorphine. We can talk more about that if you'd like to. So supply, demand, treatment, and then here's the really controversial one. Um, not everyone's gonna be ready to go into treatment on a given day. So sure, we need to have treatment on demand, available, affordable, preferably free, but until somebody is ready to go into recovery, we have to keep them alive. And that is because, I promise you this is true, dead people don't recover from their addictions. That's a prerequisite is keeping them alive. And that means we need harm reduction. So this is the last piece that I will read. On the north side of East Hastings Street in Vancouver's downtown east side is a nondescript storefront alongside many others like it. The picture of a hypodermic needle on the front door gives the appearance of a medical facility. And that impression continues on the inside. Visitors come through the door, put their names back, put their names down on the check-in desk and wait to be called into the back. Rather than the private rooms of a standard health clinic, however, the back room has a dozen stalls each with privacy blinders on either side, a metal desk, a mirror covering the wall, and a hard plastic chair. Across from the stalls is a long desk covered with medical equipment. The facility is called Insights, and while its goal is definitely health promotion, it is not your typical community clinic. Its primary purpose is reducing the harms that often attend injection drug use, with secondary goals including things like connecting those who use drugs with healthcare, providing treatment information, and offering a safe space and community for people who might struggle to find either. The injection room with its 12 stalls is staffed by health professionals and full of sterile injecting supplies. Each visitor is offered a clean needle, a sterile cooker, a filter, water, and a tourniquet. Everything needed to cook and inject heroin available in a safe, supervised environment. Insight, in other words, is a safe injection site also sometimes called a supervised drug consumption facility or an overdose prevention site. Consumers of injection drugs can come here to inject drugs with sterile equipment, mitigating the risks of contracting hepatitis C or HIV through shared needles, and they are surrounded by trained professionals should they overdose. 
Staffers at Insight are equipped with drug testing strips that can test a consumer supply for the deadly powerful opioid fentanyl, allowing the user to decide whether to decrease her dose in light of that knowledge. Should a visitor overdose anyway, the overdose reversal drug naloxone is on hand. Since opening as the first injection site in North America in 2003, Insight has served more than three and a half million people, intervened in thousands of overdoses, and recorded not a single fatality. To the extent that Americans are surprised by harm reduction strategies, we're actually a bit late to the game. The United States has slowly come around to the idea of needle exchange programs, with close to 300 open across the country by 2017. That number is absolutely dwarfed, however, by other countries. Australia, for instance, has more than 3,000 needle exchange programs, more than 10 times the number in America, serving a population that is less than one-tenth the size. As a result, there's only one needle exchange program for every 3,200 Americans who use intravenous drugs. In Australia, there's a program for every 31 people who inject drugs. Safe injection sites exist in dozens of cities around the world, with more being proposed all the time, including within the United States. And the reason is simple. They save lives and prevent suffering. As an added bonus, they also save money through decreased burdens on the healthcare system, while at the same time improving public order and increasing access to addiction and other health services by people who use drugs. By taking drugs off the streets where it's most harmful and connecting those who use injection drugs to safe equipment, public space, and healthcare information, safe injection sites are able to do a lot of good. Needle exchanges can prevent disease and naloxone distribution can reverse some overdoses, but a brick and mortar site where people can come to use drugs offers the possibility of connecting them with people and resources rather than driving them ever further into the shadows. After all, the harder it is to see the person using drugs, the harder it is to save them. Of course, if you go down this rabbit hole very far, it becomes very difficult to understand many of our current practices. What I've been suggesting here, alongside many in the field of public health, is that we should take a harm reduction approach to the injection drug crisis. Whether you buy into the philosophy of harm reduction, our current context of crisis justifies the basic strategy. We have to find a way to prevent our family members, friends, and fellow citizens drug use from killing them. You may find this eminently sensible, or you may come to it reluctantly, but either way, I think you should come to it.